Oh no, who let all of the pips out? In my last episode here, I asked you guys how can we automatically recycle critters into their food source? And you guys gave me a lot of different recommendations. And there are a lot of really good thoughts down here, but not all of them are possible. So I think it's about time we head on over to the test lab and see what all is possible and how we can automate this process right here in a nice, easy, and efficient way. So welcome to the Oxygen Not Included Test Lab. Today we're going to be murderizing critters for science. If I had to summarize all of the different comments down here, there were several different methods that you guys were mentioning of how we can actually end the critter's life before its maximum age. The first one and the most common way would be drowning in some sort of liquid. So in this example here, we just have a pip, and if you put it in water, you can see here that it will start to hold its breath and have the drowning debuff. It cannot breathe in liquid. So given enough time here, we can see that this critter will spontaneously turn into food, just like that, so meat. So drowning is easily the most common method used for recycling critters. However, it's not the only method. So another common idea was to either cook or freeze the critters. So you can see right here, we have two pips, and as we drop them either into a bath of magma or a bath of liquid oxygen, you can see that they are going to experience some very extreme temperatures. And the pip in this example comes in to life at 20 degrees Celsius. Matter of fact, I think they always come into the game at 20 degrees Celsius. And if you take a look at the temperatures right here, this one is at 19.4 and obviously this one is increasing in temperature. And if we take a look at the database here, their livable range is from negative 30 to 70. So if it goes beyond that, they will automatically die and turn into food. So if we take a look at these pips right here, what we can see is that it's taking a very, very long time for them to change temperature enough to the point where they will actually die. You can see that the temperatures over here on the left are extremely hot. We're talking about 1,600 degrees Celsius. Now it has to be in a gas environment, which means that there's not going to be as much thermal conductivity going on as compared to dunked in liquid. But if it's dunked in liquid, then it's going to be drowning. So you can see here that the temperature is increasing, but it's taking a long time, like a full cycle or so. Same with the critter over here on the right that's trying to get colder. As a matter of fact, that one's temperature is changing even slower. The way the critters work in this game is that their temperatures just tend to change very, very slowly as compared to everything else. It's almost like they're very insulated. But the common thought here is that once it turns into meat, is that that meat could potentially be automatically cooked into barbecue because it's getting extremely hot or will be preserved because it's extremely cold. And this really spawns in from the egg because if we take a raw egg and we expose it to really high temperatures, watch what happens. This raw egg here automatically turns into an omelet. But I'll have you know that that is the only food that automatically can cook itself in the game. Why it does that, I don't really know, but it's kind of cool and you can set up an automated egg cooker if you really wanted to. It's definitely a lot of fun. However, meat does not do the same thing. You can see that the meat just became incredibly hot. And if you take that out, well, now you just have a, an incredibly hot chunk of meat in your environment. Ew! Take a bite of that, dupes. However, exposed to extremely cold temperatures over here, it's automatically refrigerated, so it doesn't change per cycle. This meat will just stay there and build up over time. So there is something to having a really cold environment. But as you can see here, these critters are just living and living and living and, oh my gosh, it takes an incredibly long time for them to die when exposed to either high or low temperatures. There we go, finally. I think this little guy is gonna be here for a very long time. The next idea was what happens if you put a critter in an environment where there is no gas for them to breathe, such as the vacuum of space. Well, as it turns out, they don't care at all because they don't actually breathe which is odd because they drowned in liquid because they can't breathe, but they don't breathe when they're in a vacuum because, yep, it's just how that works. Another interesting idea was what happens if you entomb them or crush them in stuff? Well, as it turns out, nothing. They're just trapped and they get the confined debuff. <laughs> so they, their happiness is minus 10. That's so unfortunate. And then if you uncover them, boom, hey, look, they're happy again. So even if you could somehow rig up a sand trap and have the critter buried in a block of sand, you can see here that that does not kill them, nor does it suffocate them. So simply trapping them behind doors or tiles or anything like that will not get rid of the critters. So we can scratch off suffocate or crush. The one idea that was commented quite a bit was exposing a pip or something like that to a bunch of really mad poke shells down here because those poke shells will murderize anything that they get close to so long as they are protecting a pinch row. 
Now there is a downside to that. Every time you have a critter in here, despite however many poke shells you have, that critter fights back. You can actually see it in the health of the poke shells themselves. They only have 25 HP. So if you, as you drop these guys in, they slowly, they slowly will expire themselves. Although it is absolutely hilarious and quite murderous, isn't it? The big downside here is that poke shells like deep polluted dirt, so they tend to be in a polluted oxygen environment, which is not very good when it comes to storing meat because it's automatically exposed to a polluted environment. Not only that, given enough critters, your poke shells will actually die themselves. The one critter to be very wary of is the stone hatch. This bad boy is like the main battle tank of critters. Look at this, health 200 as compared to 25. <laughs> Look at him go! He is straight up fighting off all of these guys. If you drop enough stone hatches in here, the stone hatches will easily win. Look at that. So while it's definitely entertaining, it's not necessarily a very practical method because your poke shells will eventually die out themselves. And not only that, you have to maintain a pinch row in here and then you gotta worry about your duplicates. It's, it's hilarious, but it's quite impractical. The one method that was completely overlooked by everybody in the comment section here was to starve the critters. It was only mentioned once, and that was in regards to puffs or slicksters. But if you think about it, that's the easiest way to get rid of critters. If you simply lock them in a room with no food source, they will eventually die out. If you take a look at a critter, they are hungry, and once they run out of calories, there's going to be about 10 cycles or so before they expire themselves and just turn into meat. Matter of fact, that's the popular method of how to ranch Paku. If you just leave them inside of here, and so long as they don't become cramped, they will reproduce one egg in their lifespan and then die of starvation after that. So they continue to live, hatch, and die and turn into food. They are a continuous source of food that just takes time to happen. Another common thing that came up here was exposing a critter to a gas such as chlorine, but that doesn't have any negative effect on a critter. The same way a vacuum doesn't have any effect on them. But essentially, if you do have something like a slickster that consumes carbon dioxide is for its calories, that would be another version of starving the critter, is uh, just removing their food source. So of all the different methods, drowning, cooking and freezing, starving, and poke shells all work. However, the poke shells are not very practical. Cooking and freezing take a very, very long time. Starving also takes a long time. And drowning is easily the fastest method, which is why it's the most popular. So now that we know what methods work, how do we automatically recycle these critters in a timely fashion so that we can actually get the meat out of them and feed it to our duplicates without recycling our duplicates in the process? Now, there's been some recent updates to the game that allows us to really automate this in a way that we weren't able to do beforehand. And that is, they've changed the way the incubators work just a little bit. And there's also a new piece of equipment called the duplicate motion sensor. Now this allows us to make systems that are safe for our duplicate that we weren't able to do beforehand. It's a game changer. Now the thing that's recently changed here is that we can actually go ahead and select eggs that we currently don't have any available of. So if I wanted to store some pip eggs here, I can go ahead and click on that. We weren't able to click on that beforehand. We had to have some eggs in the map in order for us to be able to click on that. So. That's a big game changer right there because that allows us a single spot for the egg to be located before we go and put it in a storage bin or we put it into a conveyor loader. So in this example here, I have a hatchling egg, I have a pip egg, and then if I want to have some other critters that I'm going to be ranching up as well, such as maybe a stone hatch, I'll have that one right there, or maybe something like a larva egg, right? You can just go ahead and select those. So whenever an egg is dropped into the map, we can go ahead and deliver it right here and incubate it. And you don't even need to power this stuff. It can just be a safe spot for that egg to be so that it doesn't end up somewhere else. Okay, so how this arrangement works up here is that I have several safe spots for these eggs, and you should see that that's going to be the first spot that these duplicates deliver an egg to. The secondary spot I have over here is a storage bin. That way we can resupply these incubators as need be, or if they age out, they'll just turn into a raw egg and we can cook that into an omelet. The priority number four down here is a conveyor loader, which automatically drops an egg down here using a new piece of equipment, the conveyor chute. This will just drop it into an area down here, which allows us to hatch critters into a room that's enclosed like this. So you can see, here we go. The dupes have delivered the eggs to the incubators. The extras ended up inside of the storage bin. We can see here we have too many. So the rest end up inside of the conveyor loader and we're delivered right down here. So let's say we get some more hatch eggs up here and they just fall through. The duplicates pick those up and they're just loaded into that. And you can see, bloop, 
drops right down the bottom right there. Now right down here, this is full of carbon dioxide. That means the food will not go bad while it's down here. However, you don't want to keep the food down here because a hatch will actually eat the food, which wouldn't be good. <laughs> so keep that in mind. That's why I have an auto sweeper down here and a conveyor loader to ship that food out. So anything that's edible, boom, ends up loaded and gets out of there as fast as possible. So these critters down here will just live as long as they do and then they will eventually just starve out. However, as you can see, this critter right down here who hasn't been fed anything since the moment I brought it into this game is already up to age 20. So it's an incredibly long process sometimes. So the other option is to just dunk them in water, right? So that way they <laughs> get removed quite a bit faster now, don't they? So there we go. We dunked all of those in waters and you can see that the auto sweeper is doing its thing. And what we have over here, that's a bunch of fresh meat. Hmm, delicious. Oh, and by the way, this stuff is still incubating. Hmm, hmm, you know what that means. You don't have to do anything. Okay, so you can see what's happening here. Some of these eggs are cracking open right there. And we have raw egg right down there. And all it's done is just actually break out of the storage bin over here. I was just given enough cycles that that stuff eventually happens and boom, there you have some raw egg that you can cook up. Delicious. All right, so while I'm waiting for these eggs to hatch, let's take a quick look here at the recipes. We have omelets over here and an omelet takes in 1000 grams of raw egg and outputs 2,800 calories. It's a huge bump. We're talking 280% of what goes in comes out. However, barbecue is much less efficient in that we take 3,200 calories and we only get 4,000 out. However, it's used in higher tier recipes, such as surf and turf or frost burger. So while omelets are more efficient, barbecue has a much higher potential for higher quality foods. And that plays out here very visibly in the consumables tab. So when we take a look at this, we can see that the omelet here has a plus four morale bonus. However, barbecue has a plus eight morale. Barbecue can be added to make a surf and turf, which has a morale of plus 12, or rolled all the way up into the frost burger here, which has the morale of plus 16. So it's a much higher quality food, even though you're not getting quite as many calories out of it. So whether you want to turn your critters into omelets for extra calories, or you want to turn them into barbecue for extra morale, that's kind of how you have to play this game a little bit. So that's essentially where you can control just how many you store inside of here versus how many deliver to your conveyor loader and drown them inside of this, you know, pit of liquid down there. So yes, there we have it. We have a little hatchling down here, but unfortunately this poor hatchling was born underwater and therefore is drowning. Whoops. And then there we have it. Boom. Some meat for us. Delicious. Two kilograms worth, by the way. Hmm. So that is the easiest method I can think of right there for turning a critter directly from an egg into meat down here. However, if you already have critters like this that are running around your base, you might want to make a critter trap in order to convert them into meat. Although honestly, you could just attack them and that would be just as easy because it wouldn't really take that long. But it would be nowhere near as fun. So here's a couple different arrangements for you. Now this first example here is a drop trap. It's similar to some of the other systems I've built in the past where we kind of have a, where we have like a critter drop off and then the duplicate leaves and after a timer, then the door opens up and the critters fall down. Well, there's been some changes to how the pneumatic doors actually work and how the critters fall through those doors. So this is a new variation of the same sort of idea that allows you to force a critter to fall. So you can see in this, in this example here, a hatchling will trigger the critter sensor and if it ends up in the right spot, it actually gets forced down. So while this trap does work, it doesn't necessarily work with all the critters based on how different critters interact with the doors. So for example, a slickster here will get forced down, but it doesn't fall through the bottom pneumatic door even though that's open, where the hatchling did. So that guy is actually stuck down there. But if you have something like a pip, you can see that a pip will run across. It actually runs all over the place which is a new hit, so eventually it will end up in the wrong spot. Oh, yep, yeah, maybe. No, no, go back to the right. Oh, come on, Pip. Ha! See? There we go. It happens. They just have to end up in the right spot, and then boom, they fall through, and then they're dunked in a little bit of water. So what I'm using here is a critter sensor, and I'm just saying if this is above zero, then I take the knot of that, and I'm using a couple different signals here. So what I want to do is I want to cycle this thing closed, open up the doors on the bottom, and then I want to have it automatically reset. So if a critter is still standing in this spot, but it didn't fall, the whole thing resets. Um, otherwise, it ends up stuck. So the automation for this goes from the critter sensor, and it's above zero. We go to a not signal here, and we use that not signal. That goes to a filter gate. I have that set for three seconds. 
and then I use an exclusive OR gate. So XOR is how that one is right there, this one, exclusive OR. And then the signal out from that actually controls all of the doors. I take the knot of that and run it to the bottom doors. It's a, not all that complicated. It sounds a lot more complicated than it is, but you can see how it works right there. That's the automation signal in order to create a drop trap like that. So in this example here, when you combine the critters and the duplicates into the same sort of area, what you can see is that we'll actually drop our duplicates down as well. So they can end up in certain areas where they cannot get out. So you always have to have ladders for these duplicates to get out. It'd be really nice to have a system where the duplicates are not exposed to danger because the system cannot activate based on where a critter is. You see right here, we dropped a bunch more pips down and then the dupes are confused. Maybe they're trapped, they can't get out. Various doors and whatnot to allow them to get out is something that we've always needed to have in order for these critters to navigate their way back to safety. So while this is cool and it does work, it's relatively large and it does expose our duplicates to some potential hazards. Even though we can find ways to get them out of that problem, they could still end up there in the first place and end up with debuffs such as, you know, sopping wet. It'd be much better to have a system that doesn't expose our duplicates to dangers in the first place. So this brings me to my final arrangement right here, which isn't really anything too new. We've used these mechanized airlocks in the past in order to increase the level of water. So as a critter heads on over here, you can see that it will trip a critter sensor. And then once it trips that critter sensor, we can see that the doors are going to close and the water level is going to increase like this until there's no longer any gas exposed to that critter. So now this critter is completely submerged and therefore is drowning. The system over here on the left does the exact same thing, but it has a top-down arrangement, so the critters will actually crawl down, and then it does the same sort of thing here. So it's just a different way, different method for the same sort of thing. The only difference here is that the pneumatic door is on the top and versus the mechanized airlock on the left. There's also some automation that is, takes place so that this mechanized airlock does not open up really fast and ends up flooding the rest of the base here. You'll see that these doors will open first, and then a few seconds later, that door opens. So how the automation works for this is we say above zero and we take the knot of that and we run that to a couple of filters. The one filter that runs the doors on the bottom is set to five seconds. The one that is on top is set to 10 seconds. And then we just run two different buffer gates. No need to change the time settings there. You just go from there to there and there and you're done. Now the automation for the top down system is a little bit more simple than the one on the right. It just takes, again, above zero right there, we take the knot and we run that to all of the doors and we just have the two buffer gates down there. Boom, just like that. The motion sensor actually ties in after the knot gate. So if a duplicate is present, everything here becomes true, so therefore the doors are open. And when the doors are open, the system is safe. And because the motion detector here can actually detect its location and plus two tiles, therefore if a duplicate is ever inside of the danger zone, the system remains safe. So the thing about this system is that it will remain safe even if there's a bunch of duplicates inside of there. Not only that, it can consume things like Drecos, Slicksters, and all of those good guys. <laughs> Come on, dupes, get out of there. There we go. So now the dupes are clear. You can see that the system triggers, and therefore we can turn a lot of these critters into food. Just like that. Boom. A nice, safe system to recycle your critters and not your duplicates. In case you're wondering, this little blob of water here separates the babies from the adults, if in the case of like land-based creatures that don't crawl on the ceiling. So like hatchlings is one example right there. So that gives you an opportunity to wrangle them and if they become an adult, well, then you can send them over here and they will drown out. The top-down system works a little bit different in that a little hatchling will not jump down. Uh, compared to an adult hatch, which will eventually jump down. So if I throw a couple hatches up here, you can see that they will eventually hop down here and end up, you know, consumed by the water. So in my opinion, the top-down system over here on the left is a little bit nicer in that it allows you to separate the baby hatches from the adult hatches. But depending on which way you want to go, you can kind of use either system. And I've created blueprints of both so that you can go ahead and easily set this up inside of your base if you have that blueprint mod. So you can download those in the description below if you really want to. Boom, a very easy method to recycle your critters. You just need to make sure that you fill the water up to this tile right here. So that way you don't end up with an air pocket. So there you have it, that's how you turn critters into meat. Hope you guys have found this video somewhat informative or a little bit entertaining. Thanks for watching. If this looks like the channel for you, maybe consider hitting that subscribe button. Stay awesome, guys. Peace. Brothgar.